This is Near Allied. A podcast from Conceit Media on the relationship between creative genius and mental health. I'm Clayton Hester. To get the full library of Conceit Media podcasts, go to conceit.audio, C-O-N-C-E-I-T dot audio. Today, we'll be embarking on a journey into the life of one of the most enigmatic and revered figures in American poetry, Emily Dickinson. Born in 1830 in the quiet town of Amherst, Massachusetts, Dickinson lived much of her life in seclusion. Yet, within the confined boundaries of her family home, her mind roamed freely, capturing delicate and profound observations of life, death, and everything in between. Her poems, often somber, poignant, and imbued with a deep melancholy, offer us a window into her secluded life and the workings of her brilliant mind. In this episode, we'll explore Dickinson's world, attempting to unravel how her reclusive lifestyle, coupled with a speculated struggle with depression, shaped her creative genius. We'll delve into her unusual life, her unique style of poetry, and the powerful legacy she left behind. So join us as we pull back the curtain on Emily Dickinson's world, a world filled with simplicity on the surface and complexity at its core. Our story begins in Amherst, Massachusetts, where Emily Dickinson was born on December 10, 1830, into a family of prominence and tradition. Her father, Edward Dickinson, was a stern and ambitious lawyer who served multiple terms as a congressman. Her mother, Emily Norcross Dickinson, was a quiet and frail woman, often confined to her bed due to chronic illnesses. Emily was the middle child, with an older brother, Austin, and a younger sister, Lavinia. Although her father was emotionally distant, maintaining strict household rules, he valued education and saw to it that Emily received a comprehensive one, which was unusual for women of her time. Emily attended Amherst Academy, where she received an education that heavily focused on the English classics and Puritan values. Emily was viewed as a lively and intelligent girl, albeit somewhat unconventional. As a young woman, she began to pull away from the societal norms of her time. Where other women were looking to marry, Emily showed little interest. Instead, she seemed more taken by her friendships, particularly with her friend and probable first love, Benjamin Franklin Newton, a recent law graduate from her father's office. It's around this period in the early 1850s when we see the first signs of Emily's reclusiveness setting in. She began to retreat from social engagements, starting a gradual withdrawal into a life of solitude that would continue for the rest of her life. Her retreat from society coincided with the start of her most prolific period of writing. Over seven years, she penned more than a thousand poems. In these years, Emily also grappled with religious faith, a struggle that would profoundly shape her poetry. Emily's early life in many ways was unconventional for a woman of her time. As we delve deeper into her world, we see how this young woman, who seemingly renounced the world, was in many ways profoundly engaged with it, albeit through the private medium of her poetry. The world of the mind and the imagination was Emily's dominion, and it's in this inner world that we find her true home. In the mid-1850s, a noticeable change overcame Emily Dickinson. She began to retreat from public life, spending more time at home in the family homestead. This period of seclusion was not a sudden, abrupt decision, but rather a gradual withdrawal. While the reasons for Emily's reclusion are largely speculative, it's undeniable that this shift had a profound effect on her writing. Emily Dickinson's withdrawal from society is often seen as inexplicable and bizarre, even referred to as a self-imposed exile. However, from letters and accounts of those who knew her, it seems Emily didn't see herself as confined. Instead, she appeared to have found a certain liberation in her solitude. In one of her letters, she wrote, the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. To her divine majority, present no more, unmoved, 
She notes the chariots, pausing, at her low gate. Unmoved, an emperor be kneeling upon her mat. I've known her from an ample nation. Choose one, then close the valves of her attention, like stone. Her withdrawal from society corresponded with an incredibly productive period in her writing life. Between the years 1855 and 1865, Emily wrote nearly 1,100 poems. The solitude appeared to provide her with a freedom to explore her inner world, a world that was rich with emotion, introspection, and a deep contemplation of life and death. In her seclusion, Emily seemed to find comfort in her routine. She tended to her garden, baked for the household, and spent her time reading and writing. Her poems and letters to her close friends like Susan Gilbert, with whom she shared a deep emotional bond, indicate her mental vivacity and intensity during this period. Her retreat also allowed her to bypass the societal expectations of a woman in the Victorian era. Emily seemed to have forged a life that allowed her to write freely and explore her thoughts and emotions, unrestricted by the gaze of society. This life of solitude and routine allowed her to delve deep into her inner world, giving us the unique, insightful poetry we know and love today. Emily Dickinson's poetry was an exploration of a wide range of topics that were often deeply personal and introspective. Her seclusion allowed her to dive deeper into her thoughts and emotions, making her small bedroom a window into a vast, imaginative world. With little more than pen and paper, she was able to create complex, profound verses that continue to resonate with readers today. Her poems are intricate puzzles, laden with metaphors, imagery, and symbolism. They often discuss topics like love, nature, death, immortality, and the inner workings of the mind. Dickinson's style was marked by her use of unconventional punctuation, capitalization, and idiosyncratic syntax, making her work distinctive and immediately recognizable. Emily often wrote about nature, drawing inspiration from the flora in her own garden. In poems like, A Bird Came Down the Walk and I'll Tell You How the Sun Rose, she captures minute, intricate details of nature, reflecting a keen observer's eye and an intimate appreciation of her surroundings. A bird came down the walk. He did not know I saw. He bit an angleworm in halves and ate the fellow, raw. And then, he drank a dew from a convenient grass, and then hopped sidewise to the wall to let a beetle pass. He glanced with rapid eyes that hurried all abroad, they looked like frightened beads, I thought. He stirred his velvet head. Like one in danger cautious, I offered him a crumb, and he unrolled his feathers and rowed him softer home. Then oars divide the ocean, too silver for a seam, or butterflies, off banks of noon, leap, flashless as they swim. I'll tell you how the sun rose, a ribbon at a time. The steeples swam in amethyst. The news like squirrels ran. The hills untied their bonnets. The bobolinks begun. Then I said softly to myself, that must have been the sun. But how he set, I know not. There seemed a purple style that little boys and girls were climbing all the while, till when they reached the other side, a domini in gray, put gently up the evening bars and led the flock away. Her poems are filled with roses, bees, birds, and sunsets, each serving as metaphors for deeper, more complex ideas. Arguably, one of the most frequent and significant topics of Dickinson's poetry was death and immortality. Poems like, Because I Could Not Stop for Death and I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died, reveal Emily's complicated relationship with the concept of mortality. Rather than fearing death, Emily presents it as a part of life often personifying it and engaging it in conversation. Her poems also reflect a preoccupation with the idea of the afterlife, hinting at an intellectual curiosity and a longing for something more. Dickinson's poems, while short and often simple at first glance, are deeply layered and thought-provoking. She took complex emotions, profound thoughts, and vast concepts 
and distilled them into concise, impactful verses. Dickinson's poetic explorations were the result of a vibrant inner world, nurtured in the solitude of her room. She managed to make her reclusive life a canvas for a universe of ideas, emotions, and questions, earning her a timeless place in the canon of American poetry. Understanding Emily Dickinson's mental health is a complex endeavor. She lived during a time when mental health was poorly understood and rarely discussed openly. Therefore, much of what we surmise about Dickinson's mental state is conjecture based on her poetry and letters, the observations of her contemporaries, and her lifestyle choices. Dickinson's withdrawal from society has led many scholars to speculate about possible mental health struggles. She gradually became more reclusive in her 30s, cutting off most of her in-person social interactions. However, she maintained an active correspondence with numerous friends and family members, often writing intense emotional letters that were similar in style and content to her poetry. Several of Dickinson's biographers and literary critics have suggested that she may have suffered from depression or anxiety, based on her lifestyle and some of the themes in her work. Her poetry frequently explores topics like death, loss, and despair, and her letters often convey a deep sense of loneliness and longing. Poems like I felt a funeral in my brain and it was not death for I stood up present vivid, unsettling metaphors that suggest a mind grappling with inner turmoil. Dickinson's seclusion and the nocturnal nature of her writing also lend some credence to theories that she may have suffered from seasonal affective disorder a type of depression that's related to changes in seasons. Dickinson wrote many of her poems late at night and has described her inspiration as coming to her in the darker hours. Emily Dickinson's eccentricities, her preference for white clothing, her reluctance to leave her home, her deep fascination with death, have often been discussed in the context of her possible neurodivergence. Some have suggested she might have been on the autism spectrum. This theory is based largely on Dickinson's social withdrawal, her intense focus on her writing, and her idiosyncratic behavior. However, these theories are speculative and cannot be definitively proven. Despite the questions surrounding Dickinson's mental health, one fact remains clear. Emily Dickinson channeled whatever emotional and psychological struggles she faced into creating some of the most profound, innovative poetry in the American literary canon. Her work continues to captivate and resonate offering insights into the human condition that remain relevant and moving today. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove. He knew no haste and I had put away my labor and my leisure too, for his civility. We passed the school, where children strove at recess, in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain, we passed the setting sun, or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill, for only gossamer my gown, my tippet, only tool. We paused before a house that seemed, a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries and yet feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. Emily Dickinson's impact on the world of literature is undeniable. Her unconventional use of form and syntax, her bold exploration of complex themes like death, love, nature, and the self, and her vivid, often startling imagery have made her one of the most studied and revered poets in American literature. She was innovative, challenging the established poetic conventions of her time, and inspiring countless poets and writers who came after her. The brevity of Dickinson's verse, her striking use of metaphor, and her ability to encapsulate profound emotional experiences in a few tightly woven lines have resonated deeply with generations of readers. While Dickinson was virtually unknown during her lifetime and only a handful of her poems were published while she was alive, posthumous publication has led to her recognition as one of the great American poets. But Dickinson's legacy extends beyond the literary realm. 
Her life and work have contributed significantly to the discourse on mental health. The potential mental health struggles inferred from her poems and letters, including possible depression, anxiety, and neurodivergence, offer a compelling look at how such experiences may influence creativity and artistic expression. Dickinson's poems have provided solace and connection for many readers who struggle with their own mental health, offering them a sense of being understood and less alone. Moreover, the discussion around Dickinson's potential mental health issues has also shed light on the importance of acknowledging and understanding mental health, especially in the context of the 19th century when such discussions were largely taboo or non-existent. This continues to prompt important conversations about mental health, creativity, and societal acceptance of neurodivergence. In conclusion, Emily Dickinson's life and work serve as a powerful testament to the human capacity to transform inner pain and turmoil into art that can touch the lives of countless individuals across time and space. Her legacy continues to influence not just literature, but our understanding and discourse around mental health. Join us next time as we explore the mind of Ernest Hemingway, one of the greatest novelists and writers in the history of the United States. We'll take a look at the struggle and tragedy that surrounds Hemingway and try to understand him for the complicated figure he was. Conceit Media. Big ideas live here.